Rewind. Thank you for listening to uh, a special crossover episode. This is Remake, Rewind, and Ruin My Childhood. Crossover. I've got crossover. <laughs> now you got to do one, Katrina. Uh, That's it. She did it. Yeah. <laughs> so we are covering Mulan. Uh, so we decided to do this as a, a dual episode. We're going to upload this on the Ruin My Childhood episode. Uh, we should have just and... done a dual episode where like we each do the episode and we have people decide which one's better oh no that would it would probably be ruined my childhood if i'm being honest <laughs> <laughs> stupid wait a second uh but anyway remake rewind ruin my childhood we're all together we're gonna upload this on both feeds and uh yeah crossover episodes so with that being said <laughs> katrina what Love of my life. Yes. What do you remember about Mulan, the cartoon? The cartoon? Not a lot. I've only watched it about three times in my entire life. That's a lot. You Is can't it? Say Surely only. you remember something, though. Have you seen most movies more than three times? Uh, I feel like there was a stereotypical Chris Tucker character. Uh, Eddie Murphy? Yeah, sure. Chris Tucker I have is no a idea. Eddie Murphy character. <laughs> is he? <laughs> yeah, it's Eddie Murphy. I don't remember anything about this movie. Oh, weird. Uh, and I know, Alex, you said you, you hadn't seen it or you'd only seen it once or no, I, you were I, barely familiar with it? Yeah, I've never seen it. Like, I was, uh, I think, over the, the, the target demographic. I was a little old for it. Um, and I grew up with, you know. Uh, Aladdin and Lion King and stuff and this one just was 1998 so I was a 13 year old boy so it didn't really appeal oh, to me. Yeah, you're just outside the the wheelhouse for this one. Yeah. So I guess I'll be the resident expert on, on, on the source <laughs> material on this one. Finally uh, something you're a resident I had, expert on. I, I had two younger sisters and a younger brother so this was right in my sister's wheelhouse so she was four going on five when this came out and then uh, my brother would have been about seven or eight when this came out so and i was 10 so i definitely saw this and my sister liked it being a girl and this only being the second or third you know movie that she was able to watch and see in theaters that had a female protagonist so my little sister watched this movie all the damn time so i i pretty much remember the entire movie but um i think the standout thing for me is the chris tucker character which is actually eddie murphy he plays a dragon called mushu and he's supposed to be protecting Mulan but it's supposed to be like some other demon is supposed to protect her and so he's got this whole like rouge and there's a point where he's like dishonor on your family dishonor on your cow dishonor on your horse and it's like it I don't remember the whole line but yeah I just remember really liking Eddie Murphy in this movie and uh yeah I'm I'm really excited to go back and watch it but uh we do have a couple of comments I know Alex yeah you shared it and you got a couple people to let us know what they remembered right yeah I got a couple uh Emily Weepert says uh dishonor dishonor on your whole family dishonor on you dishonor on your cow yep there we go <laughs> she added that that's uh what her family says to her whenever she uh does something <laughs> yeah that's great yeah. um and then let's see Matthew Pelosi says uh he remembers that the one dude can't swim <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, we've that, got a few more. Katrina, really stuck a couple? My throat is so fucked. <clears throat> I think you need to read the first one. Okay. Uh, so Ant Dro ninety one said several scenes when I think of the animated Mulan. Shan Po singing about the ideal woman that can cook. The scene where they were trained make a man out of you exclamation point. I watched the new movie as well and liked it. Both films give off a different vibe. The animated one is funnier. They're singing and it's more relaxed. The new version is more serious and is more ideal on how China was back in the days. Culture, respect, and honor. Nice. Yeah. Do, we ha do we have to do the podcast anymore? <laughs> kind of covered yes. it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, I have one from Stephen C. that says, I remember Mulan being of my top 10 Disney movies when I was younger. And, I, and still, it's one of the best ones for sure. I love the humor. It had... I love the humor it had, and they had very catchy songs that were easy to sing along to. Nice. And then Nikki Britton just said, I literally remember everything. <laughs> top, so I'm, but I'm ready to... Top, oh. top 10 Disney movies. I could probably name 10. Yeah, there really aren't I that many. I don't feel like that's... There are a 
a fuck ton of Disney movies. Yeah, but like, how how many Disney movies did you grow up with? This is what we do. (laughs) All right, all right. I mean, we've covered probably 10 Disney movies on on Remake Rewind alone almost. I know that there are more than that. I'm just saying for somebody growing up, there's a window of time where they watch Disney movies. Like, the ones that I grew up with, I can name about 10. Like, I know that Fantasia is one, but I didn't grow up with it. So it's nowhere (laughs) nowhere near my top 10. Like, my top 10 Disney movies would just be the 10 that I watched when I was between the ages of 4 and 10. Snow White isn't one of them? I couldn't even tell you the plot for Snow White. Didn't she bite an apple? Really? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's the thing with Disney. It's tricky because there are Disney fanatics out there whose whole family... That's all they do is watch Disney movies, collect Disney items, go to Disneyland, go to downtown Disney. Yeah. So I think for some people you have, and I, I would throw myself in there, I we owned all the Disney movies on VHS. So, uh, okay. I mean, I watched Pinocchio. I watched uh, Little Mermaid. I watched uh, Sleeping Beauty. I had all of them. So there are families who really would just watch those movies over and over and over again. Mike, so. name every Disney movie you can't go. <sighs> okay, so you've got... We'll start with the 90s just because they're these easy ones. So late 80s, you've got Little Mermaid. You've got Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. Uh, you've got Great Mouseketeer. You've got um, the Down Under movies. I can't think of Rescuers Down Under, The Rescuers, uh, Mulan. I think I already said Hercules. Uh, Angels in the Outfield, Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, Pinocchio. Um, I mean, that's... a so you name thir- how many is that? That's thirteen. That's my point. Thirteen. Wow. Flubber. Fourteen. Uh, I mean, I don't. It's technically. A, I don't. There really aren't that many Disney classics. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think, I think Disney that's movies. Fair. I'm talking Pete's about Pete's like, Dragon. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> Jungle that, Book. Exactly. Those are Disney. Those are like what I consider in the same yeah. league as Mulan. I guess I'm talking about the animated. Uh, I think that's musicals. fair. Yeah, that's fair. I'd say that there's probably ten to fifteen total that people could say are classic. Yeah. Yeah. Let me yeah. let me name my top two Nirvana albums. That's what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's fair saying your top ten favorite Disney movies is quite a that's quite a wide number. Like I would say like top three is something that yeah. is a fair top to have. Yeah, there you go. That's fine. fair. All right. I won the first All round. Right. Let's move on with the show. <laughs> All right. So let's uh let's just get into it and talk about the animated one. So do you want you guys want to give me the the quick summary the 90 second 60 second elevator pitch you want me to do it i just saw people pointing at me all right it's china the huns are invading (laughs) it's china (laughs) it's china hundreds of years ago huns are invading and uh every family has to submit one male to join the army so they can go fight off the huns and uh, you got Mulan, whose dad is uh, a very honored soldier, but he is injured. He's got a bum leg. So she decides to make up a son that doesn't exist and infiltrate the army and just take her father's place. And she ends up rescuing China. <laughs> yeah. Pretty cool. Yep, yep. Yep. That's what happens. Yep. Oh, where are my notes? All right, let's just get into the, the animated one. Do you guys have any highlights for this? <sighs> I like um, Mushu's creative shadow puppets. Oh, that was great. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and the fact that he somehow miraculously seemed to have like toothpaste and toothbrush. That just yeah, he was almost like the genie. Nowhere. Yeah. Well, he's Kinda he's was magic. always prepared. He's got a like special yeah, he dragon is magic. <laughs> Prison pocket. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude! <laughs> oh my god. Um, yeah, I like Mushu. That was, that was funny. Uh, I like his little buddy Cricket. I kind of like it was fun. I like that something I noticed in this movie is that everybody kind of has like secretaries or sidekicks. Mushu has Cricket, Mulan has the horse. Everybody's got like somebody else just to like bounce monologues and ideas off of. That's true. Pretty much everybody's paired off. You never really see a character alone yeah. in this movie. Yeah, and like you don't think about those secondary characters as you know major characters or whatever but they're there just as often as some of the the major ones i feel like i have to go back to other movies or other like disney movies anyway and see how uh how prevalent that formula is um that would be interesting because like the only one i can think of would be 
like Beauty and the Beast, pretty much every inanimate object has somebody that they yeah. they pal around with. And then uh, Aladdin, even Aladdin, you've got Genie in the la- and the carpet, yep. Aladdin and Abu, Jasmine and the tiger. Well, uh, we're going to have to circle back to this, but I have some thoughts about Disney uh, reusing formulas, which saying that out loud, yeah, obviously. Um, <laughs> but I thought this one was kind of interesting and relevant to more modern movies. But your original question was what uh, stood out in Mulan 98 to me. Um, one of the first moments in that movie, this is kind of silly, but uh, the the end, the, so the whole section, uh, Make a Man Out of You, whatever the song is called, um, that whole song is great. But specifically the end section where it's acapella, it's like just vo- uh, vocals. For some reason that hit me in a really cool way. And I was like, this is a really good song. I really like this section. What's, the music in the whole is film is amazing. The first like two it songs didn't, is. the first two songs didn't really do a whole lot for me. They weren't bad, but I didn't get into it until like the third song. The the make make a man out of you is it is kind of the breakout song of this for a lot of people. Um the reflection song is what actually got Christina Aguilera her record la- oh, label no shit. before. Yeah, so she recorded that first and then she got her her album. Whoa, that was that's good too. So this movie was yeah. So I, I think you're right about the the make a man out of you song. What I had the same note that when the music drops out and it's just them chanting, and I've seen this movie easily ten times over the course of my life, and for whatever reason I never really noticed that, and I thought that was really effective. And it was also kicked in right when they were getting good, like it was the whole montage where they suck it's and a good when montage. they start chanting. Yeah, it was really really effective. I think that was uh, probably my highlight for for this viewing was was that i i thought the music was really really catchy yeah um um i i had a couple mushu lines that i wrote down too uh mushu was fun don't look at me i ain't biting no more butts (laughs) this was before eddie murphy was like on his decline this was pre shrek eddie murphy as well whoa really yeah yeah you call shrek was 2001 shrek is yeah peak still on it's so weird like this movie just doesn't seem to feel quite as old as the the Disney classics and it, granted it is kind of at the tail end, but it really feels yes. like a newer film. It, well, what's interesting about, or go ahead, Alex, I've got I, something to respond to, but I, I was I'll just say it, after. it might be a product of us being the age that we are, but it feels to me like, um, beauty and the beast and, uh, snow white and Cinderella and lion King, they all feel more timeless. And this movie mm-hmm. feels kind of dated and, not always in a bad way, but there's some elements where I'm like, oh, yeah, this is like from the 90s. This is like, you know, after all of these other movies. But I also, oh, yeah. and it's also I grew up with those, to, so it's hard to not be biased. It's product of a time where it was also acceptable. I mean, it was never really acceptable, but it was common to have white actors voicing Asian characters. <laughs> yeah, well, what's that's another what's note interesting is uh, and I, I've got something on that, but to your original point and how it feels different than some of the other animated movies is, uh, we were kind of talking about it before we started recording how this is a uh, a darker Disney movie and that there's a death toll. So people calculated it and like just the avalanche scene alone, Mulan <laughs> killed about two thousand people. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So it is a darker movie, and the way that Hercules came about, which we covered Hercules on um, Ruin My Childhood earlier. But that movie, they actually went through and made it lighter based off notes from this movie, that this movie was a little too dark. Yeah, oh. very, so, you know, it's funny, well, though, this movie, I, when I'm I'll, I'll let you continue. But just, uh, you know, to interject for a second, um, when I'm talking about feeling dated, the first thing that comes to my mind are some of the music choices and not like the musical songs, but just like there's a montage where she's um, cutting her hair and becoming a young man soldier or whatever. Oh, towards yeah. the beginning. And there's just like this like phased like modern drum kind of thing and uh, and the end song too it ends with like a very like 90s like funk song that's not a- apropos of the the era <laughs> the... It, it ends with a 98 degree slash stevie wonder yeah. team up but that was totally, oh is that literally I mean, what it that's, is that's still something that disney does they just have they a do. random pop song that they tack onto the end to sell the soundtrack they have to have a celebrity come in and record something because people Maybe aren't gonna just... go for danny elfman <laughs> like you know eight-year-old girls aren't yeah, gonna sure. buy danny elfman they will buy christina aguilera or at this time it's true you know what's well, stuck out to me on this R&B viewing singing. but i've i haven't watched any of the other disney classics in a long time so maybe i've just kind of blocked that out i don't remember mm-hmm. aladdin ending with uh a boys to men song or whatever 
even the rescuers was totally different it was like a really yeah like uh 60s pepsi commercial kind of vibe it it really started with uh, Beauty and the Beast. So Beauty and the Beast, they had, I don't remember who it was, but they had two really famous singers go and do A Whole New World. Um, Aladdin had, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was Aladdin. Beauty and the Beast had somebody sing A Tale of um, As Old As Time. You had George of the Jungle, not George of the Jungle. Uh, Tarzan had that Phil Collins song. Lion King obviously had all the... Uh, the music by why can I not remember any names today? <laughs> That's right. Elton too. John. <laughs> <laughs> Elton John obviously did a lot of the music for Lion King. But uh, to your point, I forgot where I was originally before you. I yes. before you interjected. But um, that song that you brought up, the weird thing as she was getting ready to leave home and go off to fight the go to a war. Uh, I had a note for that. It was very like an '80s montage, like a Rocky getting ready yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. it, it, that definitely didn't seem. That seemed like anachronistic. Like it didn't seem like it fit with that movie. So I, I do agree with you on that note. Yeah. Um, Thank you. But yeah, this movie was a darker, darker movie compared to Disney. Like going back into like the deaths, not just that avalanche, but there's a scene pretty early in the movie where the bad guys like attack a town or whatever, and there are two survivors, and they're like, "Okay, go send a message to the emperor that we're here and we're gonna like destroy everything," and. They send the two guys off, and then the bad guy goes, wait a second, how many people does it take to send a message? And then he's like, Archer guy is like, only one. And then you just see him let loose an arrow. Yeah. So it's like, they just killed a guy in cold blood in this. Like, this movie is Yikes. very dark. There's also, there are so many plot points that revolve around boobs. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and dicks. There are. Yeah. And dicks. And then the modern one, too, the, the recent one. Um, I mean, I know like the whole point of the movie is that it's a woman pretending to be a man. So it makes sense that that would come up. But it's kind of shocking for a Disney movie to be like, oh, man, I hope they don't see my boobs. Oh, no, they saw my boobs. And yeah, I don't think I'm well, exaggerating. It feels like that in the movie. I, I feel like a lot of Disney films lean heavily on the humor in cross-dressing. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, it's, never, true. it's never just in one area of the film. And yet at the same time. There's the scene towards the end where you have the reveal of all of the, the men's faces and the marble pillars and they're all made up and they look so happy at the same time. <laughs> I, I mentioned that I was watching this to a friend of mine and she goes, it's a pretty gay movie. It's good. It's very gay. What? <laughs> no, I mean like in a positive way though. Like I, I would I don't know I don't know what they say. I don't know what the gay community's that, take on this movie is, but I mean, I, I would say that's fair when you look at Mulan's relationship as Ping. Um, so in this first movie, uh, the animated one, she goes by Ping. And throughout the movie, she earns Shang. I, they, they said it a couple different ways. So it was Shang. She calls him Shang at one point. But for the podcast, I'll say Shang. Um, who it's funny was he was uh, voiced by... Um, Is that B.D. Wong? B.D. Wong. Yeah. B.D. Wong with his singing voice was Donny Osmond. Yeah. We got to come but back to the voices. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, that's where I wanted to go. So the voices, for the most part, this actually was an age. Look, listen, though. Every single movie that revolves around a soldier, doesn't matter if it's modern day or ancient China, it's going to be a little gay. <laughs> they just little always yeah. are. There's no avoiding it, really. There, there always is like the like you look at Forrest Gump. You had Forrest Gump and Bubba. There's always There's a always... bathing scene. Yeah, even yeah, if someone isn't one... cross dressing. Well, yeah, and part of it is that oh, we've been away from women for so long. Like that, something like that's always going to come up. That's always the thing. But in this, I think to your point or your friend's point that this is kind of gay positive is throughout the movie. Uh, so Mulan is the worst recruit because she is weaker than the rest of the people because you know she is a, a woman but she trains the hardest works the hardest and she ends up getting the respect from shang and throughout the movie like she has these moments with shang where he's just like he, he looks confused like they draw him like confused by like the conversations he's having and the reactions and then when it's finally revealed that she is a woman and he's like he almost looks betrayed not just because like she's been lying but like he, he's confused about this like feelings that he has for this person right and then at the end it's almost like hey you realize she's actually a woman like the emperor has to be like you realize she's a woman right like and she's pretty cool like you should probably go try to be with her clearly you're into her that was one of my favorite lines in the movie by the way uh the line is the flower that blooms in adversity is the most rare of all 
Aww. Yeah, beautiful line. Yeah. That, that was, was Pat Maruto, Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I feel like it's gay positive, though, because the message ultimately is embrace who you truly are and don't pretend to be uh, some, something else or someone else. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, it's a very po- uh, positive message for young women, but I think it applies to a lot of different uh, people. Yeah, I think so. so I can Plus, see we why got to have embraced. two montages. We got the best of both worlds. We got the makeover <laughs> montage and the fight training montage. Yeah, see, everybody's happy. Way to go, w- Disney. What's f- the 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 makeup montage where she's getting ready to uh, impress the matchmaker. I don't remember what it was, but I remember my brother came up with like a dirty version of the song where it's like, "We'll bring honor to or you'll bring honor to us all." Like he used to have something dirty that he changed that to, but I could not remember it while singing it. But I was like, "Oh my god, this song!" My brother sang this all in a goddamn time. Um, <laughs> But even that, like, I liked all that stuff with the town when she went through the matchmaker and she's, you know, she has her little, like, cheat sheet on her arm and the grandmother giving her, like, the the pearls and the jade and the lucky cricket. Like, everyone is just trying to help her be the best version of her yeah, and, within the mold that she's supposed to be. And that's also more apparent in the, in the new movie, but one of the themes of both of these movies, I think, is that family is the most important thing. And, you know, you can extend that to community. So I think that kind of resonates with what you're yeah, saying absolutely there's right. also a so when when the matchmaker's like uh not doing her up when she's um performing or doing the test or whatever it is for the matchmaker uh the matchmaker like catches her arm and gets the ink on her hand and then Such gets the ink on her, yeah on her cup or something and it looks like she has a mustache so that's another like fun like ge- um sex river or i guess gender reversal mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. So getting into just so we can get through this one and and start getting into the the second one eventually, um, just to move the plot along. The uh, I, do you guys want to talk about characters or you want to move the plot? Because I really I wanted, liked the dynamic of Mushu and and Mulan. I wanted to talk about the voices a little bit. I think Katrina did too. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Uh, they were really distracting. Like in the first twenty minutes or so of the movie, all I could think about was that a lot of the characters sound white as fuck. Well, and they have Which, different accents as well. They definitely have different accents. So, yeah. um, believe it or not, most of the cast was was of Asian descent. So you did have obviously Eddie Murphy is not. I mean, you had you could say the, most, but the, problem, but the, the bigger main character, character voices yeah. weren't the ones that are no, there. Throughout. Most of them, almost all of them were. Um, the the one that probably you would obviously recognize that wasn't was Yao, who was played by Harvey Fierstein. Yeah. And he didn't want to do it. And Disney went back to him multiple times and said, we're pre- predominantly casting Asians in this movie. Now, where there's a little what bit a of an issue and ho- where Hollywood still has this issue is a lot of times, especially in comedic movies, they just lump all Asians together. You might have yeah. something that's supposed to be Korean and they'll have Japanese, Korean, yep. Chinese and everything. This movie was very much like that. So you had like George Takei was the main ancestor and he's obviously Japanese. Mm-hmm. You had Ming Nong Wen, who's Chinese American. She was Mulan. Agents of Shield. Uh, BD Wong, Agent of Shield, yep. Um you had um the James guy. Hong, who's obviously super famous character, um Chinese actor. Uh he was like the assistant guy to the emperor who was also kind of shadowing Shang. So you did have some of these iconic um Asian American actors. Pat Morita was the emperor. You did have a few characters who were white, like the matchmaker was played by um Miriam McGoyles, who's um, Professor Sprout in the Harry Potter movies. So there are a few. The grandmother. The grandmother. Yeah. yeah. And it, I and think it, that is a really progressive choice for the time that they were consciously trying to have it be predominantly Asian. But that's definitely yeah. not something that they would try and do now. Yeah. I mean, without even getting into the the social issues that surround all of that, it was just mm-hmm. noticeable to me <laughs> and distracting. Like just in, the, the movie itself in a vacuum uh, I heard a lot of voices that were very clearly white at the beginning of the movie, and it took me out of yeah. it. it just, yeah, that's it, fair. It I, made the movie worse for me. There, you could have taken, you could have had people voice multiple roles. You see that in TV or like cartoons that are on TV all the time. So there was really no reason that you had to have these yeah. these white actors. And like, I don't know what uh, the, uh, the the grandmother stuck out to me, especially. I don't know what that, I don't know her from anything else. I don't know what that actor is bringing to that role. Like, just cast somebody who sounds right. She was in The Sound of Music and like, she's, I think she 
might have just been the voice of the the singing because the grandma wasn't in it very much. I don't know. I'd have to look into that a little bit more. And Donny Osmond too uh, is hilarious. <laughs> Donny Osmond's Osmond. just the singing voice to be but fair. But Donny no, Osmond know, and, and Leah Salonga kind of well, she's she's part Filipino, right? At least there's yes. that. But they were just kind of like ruling all of the Disney voices for a while in the singing department. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, my point is just that it's distracting. <laughs> It, it's fair to bring up, especially like Harvey Fierstein. Like he has right. such a distinct voice. Well, Eddie Murphy too. Eddie, Eddie Murphy yeah. is very Eddie funny, Murphy. but like he's Why? playing a yeah. dragon. Like he sounds like a black dude. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he distracted. plays it like yeah. He plays it like himself. Yeah. He plays it like and it, and it's such a <laughs> recognizable Cop, voice everything. too. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a fair criticism. As great as that character is, I'm going to say that again because I totally bumped the mic. Um, I think that's a fair criticism. And as great as that character is, it really doesn't fit the movie, honestly. Yeah. And I get it. But he is very enjoyable and he really does a lot of the carry a lot of the the brevity and levity of the movie. Like he's he's the one that keeps it light because there isn't. I don't even think that's fair. I was going to say there's not a lot of comedy outside of him, but that's that's really not true. There are a lot of comedy comedic moments. There's a lot the of three. slapstick. Yeah, yeah. Throughout the training montage when they're bathing with the matchmaker, all that stuff. The, yeah, with the, the matchmaker. Three, the three soldiers do a lot of slapstick. They're, they're yeah, absolutely. Stooges. Yeah, I I really liked those characters. Every time I've watched this, I really like those characters and you know one of the ones who can't swim why did i have to skip gym like they all what i really liked about them was you got a real idea of what those characters were they had distinct personalities Mm -hmm. and i do think their voices fit the characters the way they were but it was uh i I do think it was refreshing to have such a like a a large supporting cast of very unique characters yeah Yeah. which disney's good when we get into the when we get into the the live action one, I don't think that's as apparent, but we'll we'll get into that one. Um, do you guys have anything you really want to bring up? I think we'll, we'll Shh, yeah. end up talking about the this a lot when we get into the newer one, since it's omits um, a lot. Well, one of my no- one of my notes was <laughs> Shang is hot. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning of that training montage, where he fucking whips that shirt off. Like, yo, what's up? She dude? almost she almost broke character looking at that. I would too. <laughs> Fuck. I break more than well, character. Well, the grandma was all thirsty for him at the end. The mom was thirsty. Everyone I'm was saying. like, damn. Yeah. Yeah. He's cut from marble. It's a small yeah. village. <laughs> um the, uh, the horse and cow running gag kills me. Uh Eddie Murphy. I thought that was Mushu really funny. keeps on referring to Mulan's horse as a cow and then a sheep at one point. When he <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good. I liked when he was riding the panda, and he's like, the, "What's the matter? You never seen a black and white before?" <laughs> the panda's in my notes. I want to ride a panda with its consent. It's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> if I get so it when I, it's like think, a little panda cub, I think I can train it to be receptive. It just got to get a lot of bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> they do like bamboo. That's true. There's a Batman <laughs> reference in here, by the way. Oh, oh with uh. Eddie Murphy or that Mushu at the end when he has the, yeah. the glider on. And he's like, I'm vengeance or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm your worst nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, oh, I think we need to talk. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I, I have a million. No. Uh, my last one was the grandmother at the end um, talking about Shang and she goes, sign me up for the next war. And <laughs> in our current political climate, I was like, ah, I don't know about that. Oh, geez. <laughs> That's a little rough. Okay. Come on, Grandma. Uh, I think we need to talk about a few key scenes before moving on. I think the big one is the um, the reveal that she is a woman to the crowd or to the army, because uh, I think that scene is very effective. When you know they're they're gonna die, like they know they're going to die. They there's like less than ten of them going up against thousands, and Shang's like, "If we die, we die with honor." And she breaks ranks, steals the cannon cannon from from Yao sets off the avalanche takes a sword from from the bad guy and ends up riding the horse and saving a bunch of other people through all that and it isn't until they realize she's injured that you know she passes out they reveal and what i really liked about this one is they all recognized if it wasn't for her they'd all be dead and she should be dead like they should be killing her that's the law but they're like because you saved us we're gonna let you go a life and then for a life. At- a life for a life. And I thought that was very effective in this movie. I thought that 
they were obviously hurt that they were lied to, but they still had some respect for her. Yeah. Which I, which I liked. I think that's that, um, it's not really a scene, but that, uh, thread or that, uh, those moments they are connected to that played a lot better in the original than in the remake. Yeah, I, I agree. Definitely. Um, and so then the, the other big things is when she, she doesn't reveal herself again until they're already in the emperor's city and she's running around talking to like banging on doors, talking to civilians, just getting any man to try to like raise the alarm and they won't. And finally her crew is just like, we trust her and everything. And I, I, they end up working with her to to save the day, and I I thought that was really effective. And then the emperor was like, "Yeah, you're a pretty cool girl. Like, you could totally take my assistant's job if you wanted." She's like, "Not nah, like to Alex's point. Family's more important. I need to go back to my family." And then she hugs the emperor, and they're like, "Can you? Can she do <laughs> right? that?" I thought that was great. I thought, and everyone just kind of shrugs and they don't care. And then the ending is very sweet. Um, I have a couple of things I want to bring up, but I want to talk about the second movie because I think I have a few things that are applicable to both. So if you guys have anything else you guys want to talk about before we move on, by all means. Uh, just it, it's interesting to me that Mulan obviously set, has such a huge problem with authority and yet she was raised in this really strict environment. You're like, how does someone even end up being... I, for lack of a better word at the beginning of the movie she's a brat like she messes she up and instead of admitting that she did something wrong or was out of line she like doubles down on being a dramatic brat she like leaves the dinner table in the middle of the meal she dramatically runs outside yeah. and grabs a pole and sits in the rain it's like yo this is ancient china what are you doing you can't get pneumonia if you do you'll die there are no antibiotics <laughs> Yeah, no, it's I, I do agree with you. And I think I think that is one thing when we get into the second movie that is done better in the second movie, that explanation as to why she's different. Yeah. Um, but I also have issues with that as well. Like as much as I think it's a strength in the new movie, I also think it's uh, to its detriment. <laughs> yeah. um, the only other thing I have is just the the beginning of the movie, the all the different ancestors and spirits like you had like the the farmers, you had the one angry grandma talking about how. Uh, <laughs> the granddaughter is a cross dresser, and like you know, you that's your family's fault because it's obviously ancestors from both sides. Uh, and I also liked that it, it they didn't bring a ton of attention to it. It was just kind of like a throwaway line. But the reason Mushu isn't a guardian anymore is there is one of the ancestors who is missing a head. He was sent to protect that guy and got him killed, which I thought was really <laughs> funny. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's really important that Mushu was deceiving everybody the entire movie. Like, he wasn't supposed to be helping Mulan, but he kept lying to Mulan the whole movie. And it doesn't really come back until the end of the movie when the ancestors realize he destroyed the great stone dragon. But I, I, I feel like that would have been interesting if it came up that he wasn't supposed to be there and there was a little bit of tension between Mushu and Mulan at some point. Yeah. It definitely well, adds know, they, something. They got to keep it at an hour and 30 minutes. Yeah, it's hard to yeah I feel you. So uh, I think just for this week, because uh, Remake Rewind, normally we have a segment, what have you been up to? What have we been watching? But uh, with three of us here, that segment will go on for 20 minutes. So I think <laughs> we'll just skip that segment this week and move right into the second Mulan. I mean, I can give you a quick answer. Bob's Burgers. All right. Bob's Burgers. Katrina, what have you been watching? I know you've been watching some stuff. We'll, we'll each just say like one thing. Uh, the boys, and then I rewatched the scene where they crash the speedboat into the whale. Did you so watch? Spoilers. I've watched that like six times. <laughs> Have you seen the other episodes yet? Because I'm, I'm all caught up. We're not. Yeah, caught we've up. watched the. Fuck. No, we are caught up. I thought we had one more. No, we're caught up. We watched it. There's four. Woo! That show's great. The only other thing that I've been watching outside of what Katrina and I've been watching together is uh, I watched uh, Jodorowsky's. I can't remember his last name. Yodorowsky. Yodorowsky's Dune. I watched that and that was really good. Oh yeah. And uh yeah, and I watched the Dune trailer like ten times. So still haven't watched it. I'm really excited about that. I know you haven't. I'm so horny for it. I'm it's really great. excited. I I love Dune. I've read the first book several times. Um that I, I'm really excited about this movie. My my horny comment's not gonna make uh, sense outside of the context that you know because you follow my Instagram. <laughs> I just realized <laughs> that sounds weird. <laughs> I made a joke on my Instagram that I'm edging myself with the trailer, so I haven't watched it yet. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right uh alex you want to give us just a 
a synopsis for the for the the remake? Yeah, it's uh, it's the same story as the first one, uh, but there's more uh, Crouching Tiger and less dragons. <laughs> I'm also gonna raise you that it's it's essentially Chinese Star Wars. That's hilarious because that is one of my notes. So <sighs> let's jump into my point here. Um, we're talking about. <laughs> We're talking about Disney, or I was talking about Disney, and hopefully you guys are interested, uh, reusing formulas and cliches, like having the sidekick for the sidekick kind of stuff. Um, This movie feels like they're taking cues from Star Wars and uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and 300, and they have a Spartacus moment in there, too. And it just, it feels like, feels so obvious, you know? Yeah. Um, the chi is just the force, and they the force, and they play it up with the the spirit of the desert over there, trying to convince her to come to the dark side, and it's just like so obvious. And then Star Wars is already, um, you know, being a futuristic sci-fi fantasy that is taking notes from old samurai movies and stories. Mm-hmm. So then to have this aping it back. Uh, just feels like really weird. There's like an uncanny valley thing going on. It didn't ruin the movie for me, but I kept on noticing it. And there's um, the whole third act of this movie is the um, the emperor strung up uh, in a tall building that's under construction, um, being threatened by the villain to be set on fire or whatever. Which is exactly the third act of Iron Man three. Yeah, yeah, it actually, it really is. Yeah, yeah. it kind of feels did, and they like... did that shit. Sorry, they did that shit with uh, Rise of Skywalker, too. The entire third act of that movie is the third act from uh, Avengers Endgame. It's all the same thing. Yeah. It feels like they uh, took all the plots from martial arts films and then took all of the visual cues from every sci-fi movie made for the last 20 years, had a computer watch it, and then create a movie for the Chinese market. I I agree. And I think it's, it's to the detriment. And I... To be fair, I'm just going to say this at at the top. I think this movie would have been better on the big screen. It is unfortunate we had to watch it this way. Yeah. um, Because it is a beautiful film. But, you know, I I agree, but I I have one. I'm going to push back a little bit. There are a lot of shots that feel cheap. But I think the CG animals don't look good. The hawk looks terrible. I'm thinking about a lot of the... um, or some of the uh, the establishing scenes, like the the wide you know mountains or city. Well, or and I feel like they kind of slapped a filter over it, and maybe that's what they were going for. That kind of three hundred Zack Snyder <laughs> kind of, but with well, an orange hue. That's California. funny that you say Zack. That's funny that you say Zack Snyder because one of my favorite things about this movie, and that ties into that point, is that there are so many colors, and I actually love that. I love how many colors. It's very vibrant. Yeah. Yes, it's vibrant. It's gorgeous. It reminds me of the original movie because that had a lot of colors animated. You know, obviously. Um, but Zack Snyder is known for having this like heavily saturated style. But I also think that this like uh, super lit, vibrant style that this movie has makes. Uh, it creates the problems that I'm talking about with the uh, establishing shots looking kind of cheap. I think they feel like overlit. Absolutely. And I think that's fair, especially after us coming off of um, uh, 310 to Yuma, which did the establishing shot masterfully. We we talked about the, the landscape shots in that and the scope of that quite a bit. So coming off of that, I definitely could see your point that the established shots are eh on this. But to your point with the star Wars thing. And I kind of teed this up when we were wrapping up the first movie. Uh, I think her having the force is a detriment to the character of Mulan, because when you look at the first movie, she was the worst soldier and becomes the best through sheer will, determination, training. And that also speaks to, you know, Shang's character, which is not in this movie. There is no Shang in this one. There's an older general guy played by Donnie Yen, who I think is great. Love and then there's Yen. like a, there's another, his name is Huang Wei, who's kind of like a, a fourth guy in the little group of misfits, who's also kind of a love interest, but not really, but... He's, they he's definitely hint it. He's like a peer, but that, the two of them are sort of uh, the leaders of their group without actually being above their group. Officially. Yeah. There are right. a the couple characters leaders. that are combinations, right? Yeah. So you had Cricket, who was um, one of the guys, right? They kind of come. Yeah. They kind of combined the heavier set dude from the animated the one. The cuddly dude. With <laughs> with cricket he says like i was born under an ostentatious moon or something which means i'm lucky my, yeah. my mom calls me cricket um so there's that um there is no shang but back to the 
the detriment of the character, I think it really weakens her in that she wasn't necessarily the most skilled or the best. She just has a magic power that nobody else has. It makes the character less inspiring. I agree. I, I, I yeah. 100% agree that she's not as an impressive of a character as the animated one. And I'll even go as far as saying the reveal when they realize she's a woman, I think, is less effective. Because that whole scene, the avalanche scene, they're still an avalanche. But she went and had this weird moment that I didn't think had any payoff where she has like this weird sulfur pond yeah. encounter with the witch. Yeah. Who the whole time I thought was Kelly Who, and then I didn't realize it wasn't Kelly Who until the credits. Um, but she has this whole thing, and I'm thinking it's going to have like a Batman Begins thing where she's going to crack the ice and yeah. have the witch fall in. They cracked they the ice, and like, then it didn't matter. It didn't yeah. pay off. It was like yeah. Chekhov's gun that they didn't use. Yeah. But they have this scene, and then she just realized that she needs to be true to herself, which I think is a fantastic message. Mm -hmm. So she strips off her armor, and she rides back into battle and uses the force to decimate the enemy army. And nobody sees this. Like, none of her peers see her doing this, really. Yeah. They just see the tide of battle changing, and then they're going to get destroyed because they have uh, the witch turns into an army of birds and gets them to turn into like a turtle formation. I think they're and then bats. the bad guys just start using um, cam uh, the catapults to destroy the group Trebuchet. super fast. Whatever. Trebuchet, catapult. <laughs> they, they end up going to, she ends up just like, solid snaking her way and like <laughs> distracts a bunch of people what? and ends up on the mountain behind the enemy troops and sets up a bunch of helmets as a dummy so they think that there's a large group and she just takes this huge gamble that they'll turn the catapult or trebuchet and that they'll miss and shoot at by her. a mile yeah right they completely and missed yeah and so she sets off this avalanche and once again nobody knows that she's the one who did this so then yeah. at the, when she finally reveals herself they're immediately like she's a woman yeah. you need to go and there's no real reason why donnie yen's character tongue doesn't execute her he's just like i'm gonna break the rules but if i never you better never come back yeah and i don't feel like that was as effective yeah i agree um the i agree with katrina that it having her have a superpower makes it less inspiring um but i also think that how do i say this i think that would be less of an issue if this sulfur ice scene that we were talking about was not there or was done better or was more like the original movie yeah. like i think the 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 message of the movie is her is not her becoming a soldier it's her becoming comfortable with who she is so right. It's not a uh, for me. It's it, it's less of an issue that she's not inspiring as long as she's still like going through this um, transformation this and becoming self confident. This journey, but this scene kind of ruins both of those things. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah, well, yeah it, and, and it, it takes away to, both. More to her like journey of acceptance with her family. Like, does her father even really express that he still cares about her before he finds out that she's done this amazing thing and saved China? Yeah, in this one, he absolutely does. So when she comes back after saving China and she goes to try to explain herself and he's like, I'm the one who should apologize. I pushed you away. I love you. And that's more important. And I actually think this was a very effective scene. So yeah. Tung shows up and is like, hey, I need to talk to Mulan. And the father is like, hey, she's my daughter. If you're going to go after her, you need to come through me. And he's like, no, dog. I got mad respect for Mulan. <laughs> that whole that whole she, scene was really effective for me, actually. I thought that was great. And what I really appreciated, Katrina and I, while we were watching the movie, I brought this up a couple of times. I'm like, first off, in this one, it seems like her dad is a much higher esteemed officer in the fact that the general knows who he was and says he was a peer. And even hints that her dad was like borderline Jedi. Yeah. And everything. So... And I think in the first movie, and I think the, in the first movie, the cartoon, the dad was more of a badass because you see him doing his sword kata and everything. And it wasn't until like he goes to put the sword in the sheath when he's done, he kind of falls down. In this one, the dad can't even hold the sword without trembling. So I feel like in both movies, no matter what, if the dad were to report for duty, he would have been in like in a tent leading armies and everything. He wouldn't have been on the front lines. I feel like especially in this movie, he probably wouldn't have been in that much danger. Yeah. That's one of those, so, that's one of those in, things in both these movies where it's like, ah, don't worry about this. We need to get to the, the meat of the movie. 
Yeah, right. but in the first one, I just feel like the father was not a well-rounded character. Like we didn't get that big moment um, yeah. before no, she didn't. came back. Like in that first first movie, it really took him finding out that she'd done this big thing for him to even think about accepting her again. Where this one, he's a much more effective character, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense either way. Right. Yeah. And I think to your point as to why she was kind of a brat in the first movie makes sense in this one in that she the, the father clearly wanted a, a son and she had the force and he recognized the force. So he kind of fostered her force abilities early on until his until the mother is like, you're going to get her accused of being a witch and she's going to get killed. You need to like step off which is a nice little foreshadow because then there's a witch later in the movie which is like oh if you go down this road you could end up like this mm. yeah and like the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie really play in because at the beginning of the movie when you realize she has the force or the chi she is chasing a chicken and she's doing like parkour and wire food. roofs and everything she's like a and jedi with adhd <laughs> yeah, at the end of the movie, when she's fighting Bori Khan um, in the construction site at the end of Iron Man 3, she is doing the same thing. She's chasing the bird to get to where the bad guy is. So the witch turns into the bird and is leading her to the bad guy, and she's doing her parkour across the roofs. Like and it's in a, the original one, the time. bird is turned into a chicken by Mushu. Yeah, and he rides him into battle. <laughs> yeah. So it's all these great callbacks. Um, and... All the, and you get the, the Darth Vader thing, Star Wars, just really quick. The witch, the she is like, man, no one's ever going to accept us. And then when Mulan is just magically accepted by like the entire army and is allowed to lead the army, she's just like, oh, I'm going to sacrifice. And she like sacrifices herself like Darth Vader at the end of the movie. Yeah, that the witch was really uh, shoehorned in there. I didn't. I understand I why they like did it, it, but I didn't care for it. I didn't like it at all. I mean, all. she was a it, badass in her fight scenes, but uh, I don't I feel, feel like, like those, the character added anything. I feel like those fight scenes cheapen the movie. And maybe it's some kind of style yeah. of fighting that I am not familiar with, but it just looked like a totally different, such a different style from the other characters that it, it just took me even further away from China, which is something that was interesting yeah, for me in that the first movie, I feel like the world was much more fleshed out. And this one is like, you know, it's... It, it's a sci-fi fever yeah. dream for the atmosphere in that everything is so exaggerated and contrasty. And I feel like it, it takes us away from ancient China in a way that the first one didn't. And, and I think that's interesting. And I think I'm, I'm just going to put out this question right now. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get together and figure it out. But like, who was this movie made for? I don't know. That's a great question. <laughs> so, I actually disagree with Katrina a little bit there. I really enjoyed the the action and the fight scenes. Um, I don't think they're no, the best. No, I, I just don't like the villains' fight scenes. The other ones were great, oh, okay. but the villains' okay. fight scenes are just such a different style. And I felt like they did the martial arts so incredibly well in everything else and made it fresh and different, which okay, is surprising. So we're kind of saying the same thing then. No, I think like that's the strong point of this film. I just feel like the okay. world yeah. the world feels like the three hundred fever dream version <laughs> of that universe remind, instead of something me, with like grounded depth to it. Yeah. Remind me what the um the witches uh fight things are that's different from the other characters. It's just so more like has... tumbling and like MMA kind of stuff. But not it, really... it's a lot of that. It's it's using the fabric and using lassos and using like ripping people's faces off with her claws and everything like it's I more like superhero. The point is it's yeah the point is it is supposed to be so much more different and the only people who are even close to her are of course mulan the emperor who gets defeated like within a 10 seconds of fighting and then you have the few of her like knights of ren that she trained that can run up walls and stuff like that so I, and all of her stuff was brief i do feel like it is definitely different i thought it was good but i i do i can see why you don't for me it kind of felt like i, I know katrina's seen this movie because i made her watch it i don't know if you've seen it but um the forbidden kingdom mm -hmm. which had jackie chan jet lee um, it's basically an american movie that they tried to make like a crouching tiger hidden dragon mystical chinese martial arts film yeah. i really felt like this movie is that but they're just like we're not gonna have the white character in it it's it's gonna be an asian cast 
and we're going to get rid of this, but it doesn't really feel like it made this movie is made for any particular group because I honestly think if this movie were to come out in theaters, let's say where there wasn't a pandemic, this was supposed to come out in May. I think this movie would have made a ton of money, but I think a lot of people would have been disappointed yeah. because the people who grew up watching the cartoon are expecting some of the stuff from the cartoon. And this wasn't a musical. It did have some of the score, like it had the Christian Aguilera reflection song as a score. It had the on the bring battlefield a... where it didn't make yeah. any sense and didn't <laughs> and, flow and just didn't work. It was so frustrating. And, and when she and it replaced the '80s montage theme when she was getting dressed as yes. a soldier for the first time and leaving. You also had the when she was getting ready for the matchmaker. It had the "You'll Bring Honor to Us" as a score. I was really disappointed that the um, "Make a Man Out of You" wasn't the score for that. Right, like, we, there wasn't even an orchestra of, version. We got each character's like little theme uh, music at certain points, and we got instrumental versions of certain things. But that's a huge fail, honestly. Right. Like I. I almost feel like they would have been better off just completely starting over and scrapping this whole film and going back to making it a musical because that was such the strong point of the first one. And I think this could have been an incredible film if they had taken a time to figure out how to work in the original music with the martial arts. Right. And I think the, that's my next point is they clearly wanted to make this for the Chinese market. Now, the Chinese market is the second biggest movie market outside of the U.S., and more and more movies are starting to get made. Uh, Iron Man 3 had yeah. special scenes that only aired in China. And they, they had, had like they Chinese had surgeons that took out his heart. Well, and aren't yeah, things they, starting they, to they, premiere there first? Or testing there first? Things are starting to premiere there first. There's a lot of joint ventures. So that um, that shark movie, The Meg, oh. with... Uh, <laughs> with uh, yeah, that movie was a Chinese-American film. Like, there was a joint venture. Transformers... Uh, two, two of the last three Transformers movies had specific product marketing for like a weird cream and milk wow. that's in China. Sure. So like we are starting to see movies do that. Like it was actually a big deal that um, Endgame played there because for a long time you couldn't have time travel in, chi in movies in China. So like we are what? really trying to, yeah, you can't, you, for a long time you could not have any movies that had time travel that is in crazy what they didn't want to foster that vein of creativity <laughs> well i think they have so, i think it extends to like uh use of magic or something too doesn't it yeah certain magics you what? can't use yeah the villain the villain always has to lose which is something where um when we when we covered uh, uh, infernal affairs and the <laughs> departed uh, they're actually <laughs> not the, infernal the, affairs the, yeah the uh, the ending of the the hong kong version of the film um, is different than the one that was released in mainland China. The bad guy gets killed. Where, but then they ended up making two other movies afterwards. Like it's super <laughs> weird that the roles that they have. But in this movie, the main reason they didn't have Mushu, like they they announced that it wasn't going to be a musical, but it would have music from the original. And they said they couldn't have Mushu because dragons are extremely important to Chinese culture, which mm -hmm. is true. Um, so they they didn't want to relegate a or a a spiritual dragon to a sidekick so instead they kind of like ham fist this phoenix in, and it's like <laughs> i feel like they yeah they could have made the phoenix mushu and had it be like a spiritual guardian as opposed to was the phoenix ever there was it a hallucination like yeah. what was going on with this like i feel like they wanted to have their cake and eat it too they're like oh this is a live action disney remake but we also are making it for the chinese market like i honestly can't see how this makes anybody happy it was really yeah, heavy-handed I, I i don't agree that it needed to have the that it should have been a musical or whatever and i really uh i liked that it was a totally different genre and like style and take on the movie and i liked that it was more of um i don't i think the genre is called wuxia i might be wrong about that but the crouching tiger like that um and hero that uh that genre is very specific to to china and chinese culture um, and I liked having all the wire foo and stuff. I thought it was really cool to lean into that kind of stuff. Um, and it kind of, that idea makes a remake more worthwhile to me than doing a shot for shot remake, you know, like Psycho or something. Um, so I didn't mind that they didn't include the music, but I agree that it was not executed well enough to justify not doing the thing that people wanted. You know, if you're yeah. gonna, if you're gonna not do something like right. you know, bring the bring the songs back and make it a musical and disappoint yeah. people, you have to give them a reason to enjoy it. Like this is I thought we were is, I thought yeah, we were exactly. gonna get a better, more woke version of Mulan. 
And well, instead, and I, the it's entire, a completely the entire cast different was, movie. The entire cast was of Asian descent, so that's the woke moment. That's what you get. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I think that, that speaks volumes to this. Like, I think if this movie wasn't a Disney movie and it wasn't marketed as a Disney remake, I think it would have been a lot more enjoyable. But I just yeah. feel like it didn't deliver on any real thing that it was trying to do. It, yeah, I it think feels- it's a good movie in its own right, but it doesn't feel like it's Mulan. It doesn't feel like it's trying to do anything even similar to the first one. And I yeah. felt like they really missed every opportunity that they, they could have used so beautifully with the music. Because they're amazing melodies. They're so catchy and it's it's so effective in the first movie. I feel like they could have done something more with it. I, w- I would have rather them just completely, like Alex said, go a different direction. Like Because there were still a lot of little things where they took out the music, but they still had the the scene where they were talking about you know, their ideal women right before they go off to war, which mm. is a whole song in this. And it's like, it just seems weird that they have all these little moments. A lot of the training stuff was the same with them falling in the water and the buckets. And it's, it, I don't know. It's just, there were so many moments that were from the cartoon where it's like, they did just enough where you go, Hey, you know, we, we did mimic the cartoon, but it's just like these, this isn't the stuff we want. I think that, this that's would, what drove me crazy. I think this could be, Um, recreated very closely and play really, really well as a live show. Oh, yeah. I think it works better for that. Just the way the way this world feels and uh, the extremes in this performance. Um, Because it's funny, I think some of the fight scenes end up more dramatic in this depiction than in the animated version where they usually Mm -hmm. take more liberties there. I, I was not expecting when she was untying the emperor when they're like fighting in that bamboo scaffolding that oh yeah the villain was just gonna jolt awake and grab the bow and somehow managed to shoot it and she was gonna jump midair just to like kick the arrow into him yeah. so it's so she did that absurd <laughs> so and it's even more absurd like than what that. you said because what actually happened was she was untying the emperor after kicking this guy down hundreds of feet, somehow him surviving, grabbing the bow, shooting it up, she unties the emperor, not realizing he's shooting at her. The emperor like pushes her aside, right? As he unties, she unties the knot. He catches it. He throws the arrow sideways. She runs, jumps, bounces off a wall, catches it in midair, and then throws it at the bad guy. They're all using it's the even force. more absurd. They're all using yeah, the force. it's absurd. She plucks I a man didn't... from a moving avalanche. The fact that she can even ride a, a horse through an avalanche well, isn't you know enough. What? That, that was in the cartoon, actually, so we got to yeah. give her that one. <laughs> the, I hated they it. Lift, they lift a horse with a, with a Mulan and then um, whoever the guy is on the horse uh, up from the, the side of the cliff in the cartoon. Yeah. So it's kind of the same. Yep. Yeah. Um, I didn't mind her kicking the arrow, but again, it's just it's an execution thing for me. I was like, oh, this yeah. would have been cool if they justified it a little bit more i guess yeah yeah i, I actually in- my my complaint with that scene is that um i thought the beam fight was really cool like they um the bad guy and uh and mulan end up on opposite sides of this beam that's hanging at a construction site and it's um being held by a rope in the middle so the two of them end up on either side and the villain realizes that if he walks closer to mulan then her side will uh, dip down because gravity is a thing and so he does that and she's like fuck I have to walk closer to him so I don't fall off but then I'm also within arm's reach of him grabbing me he's forcing me into a fight and I just thought that was like a really cool setup for a martial arts movie um, but then it was over in like 30 seconds and I was like oh she just cuts the rope and like holds on to it which right. which is a which is a great idea like that's the way that should have ended it's clever and that's wonderful but it just happened immediately like that should have been a fight you know and I think the other thing is we see the other witch have these incredible powers where she can control fabric. She Jet turns into a fabric. bird. She turns into a bird, turns into like a swarm of birds or bats, bats. or whatever those were. And we, we do get the line that Mulan is just coming into her powers and that she dampened her powers by, you know, whatever. But it, it's just hand waving away. Like I would have liked to see yeah. her come up with like some new power and then – but still, her creativity is what ended up defeating the guy. I like, or, or, I or even I, I don't think even come up with a new power. I think it's the the solution is the opposite. I think get rid of or limit the witch's powers, because it's just like oh, she can do anything. So yeah. what's, what's the point? You know, if it's if it's this, 
if you have established rules like the chi allows you to flip through the air in a graceful way and have you know control over that's your fair. senses so that you can kick an arrow that's cool but you can't transform into something because that's insane you know You're right if she, it's the difference between saying like okay she's like captain america she's peak human physicality versus right. she's doctor strange she can travel to another dimension yeah, that's fair. Well, what what I meant was more along the lines of I would like to see her trying to use some of this magic, and the bad guy is somewhat learned in the magic. Like he's not an expert like the witch, but she ha he has some of the the skills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he can run up the walls. He can do the acrobatic stuff. He can catch the arrows in midair. So I would like to see her try to go toe to toe with him on a magic level and realizing. That's not necessarily what she needs to do to win and then uses her cleverness with the rope. I would have right. liked to see a little bit more of if if we're going to make this a Star Wars movie, I would have liked to see her have a little bit more well, than what she had. They yeah. did make it a Star Wars movie because in The Rise of Skywalker, the Emperor is just not dead anymore and uh, yeah. can shoot lightning <laughs> into the sky and destroy a thousand ships. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I think we've talked this movie to death. I We obviously didn't bring up everything, but... I'm just going to say, for me, in terms of ruining my childhood, I actually really enjoyed the cartoon watching it again. I, I really, really enjoyed it, and I would totally watch that again in a couple years. I don't think I'll ever watch the live-action one again. Yeah. I, yeah, if I had a kid, I wouldn't mind showing them the live-action one, but I'd rather explain some of the problematic stuff from the original than... uh I don't know what the alternative is. <laughs> I think <laughs> I don't know. Like <laughs> they'd have to sit this, through this multiple times. Like it was fine, but I don't need to watch it again. I don't think this new one is a kids' movie though. It's very it's violent. Not. It, you're asking, it seems yeah, like you're, a bit of a family movie, but uh just going like full American with the violence. I don't know how feels, there's no made a PG. You're asking who what the audience is, and I think the audience is like the younger but not young sisters of little boys that like star wars and marvel yeah i think you're <laughs> right but i'm saying like this is not one like i would maybe show this to somebody 10 or older the the new one yeah but somebody under 10 i would not let them watch this movie and what's weird is this was rated like pg not even pg-13 which what? i think well that's pg is 10 and the pg it doesn't have any rate age it's just I, parental guidance it, no, it I has know, but some I, themes but i well, think that's, what that's I'm fair saying, to that's... say about a 10 year old but yeah yeah but, but yeah, yeah like movie, Disney this... movies, you should be able to show to your five year old, right? Yeah, I would not show this to, you know, we have we have a, a one of our nephews just turned thirteen, the other one's eleven. I would let them watch this, but I don't think I'd let the younger of our our nieces and nephews watch this movie. Yeah, not definitely yet. not. For me, thanks for asking. Uh, the first one did not ruin my childhood. I think um, I had really only seen this because I was a nanny. I didn't really have like a childhood viewing experience with this and revisiting it made me enjoy it so much more and realize that uh, the pacing is really great for the first one. It's very entertaining in that way. I think it has uh, more comedy that I really like and the music is fantastic. The new one, it just doesn't feel like Mulan. I think if I, if I were approaching it not having any expectation of comparing it to anything else, it's enjoyable and visually it's amazing um but where it falls short for me is that i feel like i was expecting uh more empowerment beyond oh well she's yeah. a witch of some kind yeah and and, and i think it, part of what ruins that for me is that i expected more of the traditional martial arts but really technically heightened and i was expecting to be impressed in that way like her her abilities make her amazing in that way and yeah. a little bit less of the sci-fi style fighting on wires well yeah. again again similar to donnie yen or similar to uh, star wars i'm gonna say it again again similar to star wars you only get one dope donnie yen scene and then the rest of it is wires yeah and cg <laughs> yeah yeah that really great like fight thing at the beginning just one other thing one thing i want to say before wrapping up the episode the other thing that I thought was a little weird on the remake was uh, it had three voiceover sections. It had the father narrating the beginning, the end, and then like one random thing in the middle. And it kind of took me out in the middle. Oh, yeah, that the was beginning, weird. The beginning one I didn't like because it was like um, the newer Robin Hood movie and the newer Three Musketeers where it's like, 
you've heard the story of Mulan before, but you haven't heard this version. This is my version, her <laughs> father's version. And I was like, really? And then the ending was, the one thing I really did like about the ending of the, the live action one was that the emperor's like, hey, I want you to be on my council. And she's like, I got to go back to my family. He's like, that's cool. You go to your family. But he sends like the general to follow her. And he's like, hey, make peace with your family and then come back for the job so i did like that but then it ends with this voiceover where it's like she went on to bring peace to china for me for whatever reason her being a witch i immediately went like she went on to lead the biggest genocide of all time kind of thing <laughs> like my dark sense of humor brought that up hey wouldn't it have been better if uh the last voiceover was mulan yeah why not yeah 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 or even if the witch was the voiceover on the front end and back end being like having some sort of lesson like about acceptance like here you know i was i'm more into Jedi. getting rid of that character yeah yeah but i'm saying like even her i feel would have been given more female empowerment yeah 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 to even Definitely. have her be the front end or the back end any of them but uh that's it uh news really quick i'm just gonna read off three head oh go ahead alex uh i will say the migna wen cameo was really cool yeah i liked that. yeah i like that sweet. i thought she was gonna be the matchmaker <laughs> no, I like oh. that she was just at the end. She's the esteemed Just a guest. random person. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it's just nice. They put the spotlight on her for a moment. She looks incredible. And she's just like, she's so charismatic and cool. It's just cool. She's to great. I, I like her and everything I've seen her in. Even, yeah. even that shitty Street Fighter movie. <laughs> she's the best part of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, news really quick. I'm just going to read three things. Batman has COVID. And uh, the movie got on uh, put on hold for that. If the Dune trailer terrifying. was great. Oh my god! If the Rock, if the Rock and Batman are getting COVID, maybe we should be indoors for a little bit longer. Okay. Well, the Rock yeah. got it because he like was an idiot and had dinner with these people. Yeah, he uh, had family friends over. Yeah, he didn't get it working. That. But that's terrifying. So no, on the sixteenth, still... I'm having my first COVID test to go back to set. Uh, we're filming pending uh, a negative test result we shoot the 18th we go wherever for the weekend then we come back on on that monday and tuesday and we keep shooting and i'm like what they expect all these people to just like actually be safe at home on the weekend yeah nope. like no wonder they're... batman got covid we're all gonna <laughs> die rationale is probably we're gonna that... die shooting a freeform show michael <laughs> i know i don't think it's fine but i'm saying they're probably their rationale is probably well if they tested negative on friday or thursday or whatever it was considering the uh, cost i guess it's not so free form right but i'm thinking <laughs> what their rationale and i don't agree with it is that well they got the negative test on this day so even if they get infected on the weekend they're not going to be able to transmit it yet because you have the incubation period. How I don't long agree is with the that mentality. Incubation menta period. Yeah, we don't. It's any. It, we, we don't, don't know. know for sure. It, it's anywhere from like I've seen. It I don't as think there is an incubation short period. as like three to days. I've seen it's like seven days. That's we horrifying. We don't know enough, and that's. I, I agree with you that I don't think that's enough. I think that they should push There's it to the, Tuesday and do another test on Saturday or Monday or Sunday or Monday, but. That Smash Mouth concert uh, apparently created like two hundred thousand cases, so I don't think there's an. Oh, is that the, uh, the, the the biker rally up in North yeah. Dakota? This yeah. is why I've always hated Smash Mouth. This moment right here. Oh, I just, I just somebody once told me the world was going to roll them. me. So uh. in like 2010, my uh, Smash Mouth played at one of the high schools in my hometown. Just for like, <laughs> I a remember movie. that. Cool. <laughs> Uh, and the my other two stories, Dune. We already talked about the trailer. Dune? I loved it. Dune, Dune. and Dune. Uh, Alex is using it to the one to, in the desert. To, yeah, Dune. Alex is using it to edge. We got to get our got, rocks off somehow, buddy. Quarantine. The Candyman, tra the Candyman movie got delayed to some unknown date in 2021, which I think makes sense. I have no yeah. idea what the Candyman is. Oh, it's uh, Jordan Peele's producing a remake of a classic late 80s horror film it's yep. it's good it's a it, it's kind of like a, a what horror is it, bloody film? mary yes what's a, a bloody mary film? bloody mary bloody mary in the mirror but it's it's candy man candy man candy man uh, it's gonna be good but it. uh yeah that's all the news tony Todd. thank you guys thanks you guys for listening please uh follow katrina on the internet katrina where can our listeners find you i'm all over the internet at katrinaosity yeah alex plug plug your shit uh, I'm on Instagram at dysalexic, D-Y-S, Alex I-C. I'm on Twitter at Polishi, my last name. 
Uh, I'm on Letterboxd if you want to follow along oh, yeah. with what I've been watching. That's at Palishi as well. And lately it's just been our movies, but I'm going to try to watch some more stuff. I've just been obsessed with Bob's Burgers. Um, and you can follow <laughs> my OnlyFans. DM me for that. <laughs> <laughs> and his Etsy. He's got some great t-shirts and some pins out hey, there. Thanks. That's true. Yeah. Uh, we, we've got, Katrina and I have a couple of his shirts. I, uh, I sent a... Uh, Alex, a pin suggestion today. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but it would be really cool if it did. He's shaking his head no on our <laughs> FaceTime call. It's fine. Uh, you guys could check out that everything that's, uh, I'm going to say that again. You can check out everything that's MDX Pods related at mdxpods.com, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all at MDX Pods. If you want to support the show, uh, you can go to MDX Pod. sorry, you can go to patreon.com slash MDX Pods if you want to support the show financially, if you want. Uh, Alex and I have been doing some bonus episodes for the Fast and the Furious. Right now, these are going to be on our normal feed. But once we get through the Fast movies, we're going to transition to these bonus episodes only being on Patreon. So uh, check that out. And thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks for listening.